Can you see me? Yeah, you're on. Okay, testing, testing. Are we on? Are you on? Um, I think, yeah, I'm on. I'm on. Okay, we're on. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I am very pleased wow. to be joined by my guest here today, Tom Shepard. Tom, how's it going? Oh, it's good. Yeah, thank you for inviting me and uh, always a pleasure to talk, for sure. Good, good, good. It's, um, we were introduced by Cara at the staff canteen. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to just sort of delve into sort of your experiences and share some information with the audience today that will help them on their journeys in terms of mental health and well-being and business structures. But Cara has very kindly sent me over a little introduction. Okay. So <laughs> for, uh, for anyone who is unaware of who Tom is, Tom uh, was born in Sutton Coalfield in the West Midlands and has worked at Michelin star level throughout his career, including Michael Wignall, at the Latimer and restaurant Sat Baines. Tom was offered his first head chef role at Michelin starred Adams restaurant in Birmingham. And he then went to open his own restaurant in 2021, upstairs by Tom Shepherd in Litchfield. Having achieved his own Michelin star just four months later, which is fucking epic, mate. So well done. That's great work. Thank you, mate. He has picked up further accolades since then, including three AA rosettes, and recently had success on BBC's Great British Menu, getting his cow pie to the banquet. Tom's been really open in the past, especially on recent podcasts, about his own mental health experiences. And he left professional kitchens and cooked for a private household to get a break from the pressures. So, in terms of talking about the subject of mental health and, and, and well-being, what was it that led you to firstly experience or to understand that you perhaps were struggling with your mental health? Yes, um, well, it's a great introduction as well. Thank you for that as well. I might have to ask you to come with us everywhere else. I know, to be fair, with an introduction like that. Um, no, from a mental health perspective, I think, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm 35 now, so I started being a chef when I was 18. Uh, and I think I sort of had my first first sort of mental health sort of episode, if you will, uh, if you want to call it that, uh, when I was about 21, 22. And it was, I think it was purely brought on by sort of a, just, a, just a stressful environment that kitchens were. Uh, you obviously put yourself under a lot of stress as well and pressure to perform uh, because that's the type of environment. Um, the kitchens were very sort of macho, macho sort of platforms where you sort of, you know, only the toughest, toughest survive. That was the type of impression that I got from coming into the industry. And uh, I just obviously, I'm, I'm quite a, quite a passionate person and, and someone who, you know, doesn't want to sort of show weakness. I think that was also an issue as well. Uh, so these, these category of, 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 of problems just mounted and mounted and got to a point where, yeah, I was, I was struggling physically and mentally. What was the first time? I mean, a similar sort of experience to yourself, obviously not working in kitchens, but supplying yeah, kitchens, yeah. but the stigma and the... Uh, absolutely ridiculous, yeah. It was, it's, uh, I mean, I've said on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the Staff Canteen podcast, I mean, I remember when I entered into the, the, my first kitchen and... I was asked that staff food, we, we, we as chefs would prepare staff food for this hotel and there's like 70, 70, 80 people who, employees who work there. And uh, you'd never see a chef up there. And it's like, why? And it's like, because chefs don't need staff food. And it's like, what? So yeah, chefs don't need staff food. You'd be able to get out the whole day of any, having any staff food. And even if I put like a drink to my lips, it'd be like, why are you drinking? Because uh, I'm really thirsty. It was like, yeah, but you don't need to drink. Just get through it, just stop it, it wastes time. And it's that sort of like, that mentality where I got into, it was just, it was, I was in a two rows at restaurant. And I'm not gonna be like subjective with these places, but it wasn't like, you know, on the pinnacle of the cooking, cooking scene. This was just a standard two rows at wedding heavy restaurant. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And um, it was just pathetic, but because you were the outsider, so if anyone went up for staff food, you just get the, you know, just get the piss ripped out of you, unfortunately. It was just ridiculous. So it got to a point when, you just ate when they ate, which was either on your break, when you just go to Tesco's and get a meal deal, or you just waited until obviously after you after you and probably got a takeaway then. So I mean, it, it's, even the food that you're eating isn't isn't sustainable uh, with that as well. So, and unfortunately, though, those sort of the first five years of my career is very much like that. And then as you go through to the kitchens, like you've mentioned, yeah, you know, the, the performance levels and, and the and the and the sort of stress and pressure that you put yourself on just to perform at that level, because you know, when you're working too much in star restaurant. You don't want to be the one that sort of, well, I mean, the worst fear is if, would you serve the dish that essentially loses yeah, stars? Yeah, Obviously, that's yeah. never going to happen. But at the same point, that is a fear of yours. So you do put a lot of pressure, uh, pressure against yourself. But I think the, the main factor of our industry, without a doubt, is, is the rest part. Is, is I just, 
listen, we can all push ourselves from day to day. We can all have long days. There's no two ways about it. But there has to be some sort of respite and there has to be some sort of recovery. And I think we, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, you know, I think the hospitality industry, industry is just a dinosaur compared to others. And um, it's imperative that we change that. And I think that work-life balance, which people allude to all the time, it's not essentially a work-life balance. It's, it's being able to recover from work. That's actually what it is. That's where the balance has to come in. And, um, and that's what something I, I took on very, very early in my career. And it was something if I was ever in a position, so, you know, knowing not what the future holds, but if I was ever, ever, ever in a position that I could actually make a positive change to that, I definitely would. And I like to think to, uh, upstairs that's exactly what we do. So in terms of, I mean, early signs for, yeah. your, for yourself. Yeah, really like, easy. Yeah. You know, again, we're told that we should be right robots, right? You don't yeah. feel, you don't, you don't need to eat, you don't need to drink. Besides ignoring your basic instincts and your basic needs as a human being, what were some of the early signs that you started to experience where you went, you look back now and go, fuck, actually, hold on a sec, that oh, was... Oh, horrible. The, 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 the episodes during work were very much sort of an overwhelming sensation. And I mean, that could have been caused from, from many different things. Like you said, I, I wasn't even fueling myself, so that could have been quite easy, that. But it was an overwhelming sort of, almost like an overwhelming sensation where I just couldn't, I had no control. So the episodes during service where I'd just, I'd feel really faint. Uh, I'd go really heady. I would obviously just want to sort of escape from the room. I didn't want to be, I didn't want to cook yeah, uh, because yeah. I felt that something bad was going to happen. And that sort of feeling, to be honest, carried on well, until I, I took that break when I was 20, 27, 28. Um, and it, it just had to come. It, I was, I think it was the third time I called the paramedics during, during a, sleep, a sleepless night. And the paramedic just rushed upstairs, broke the front door to, to, the, to the rental property that I was in at the time, rushed upstairs because I think, you know, I was given the impression on the phone that I was obviously having a heart attack. And uh, he just stood over the top of me and was just like, calm down, Tom. And I was just, I was like, I'm having a, I'm having a heart attack. I was hyperventilating, I was struggling. And he said, what do you do? And I, I told him how I worked at the time. He said, why do you do it? Yeah. And I just said, I, I, um, I, don't, I don't know, I don't know really. And he said, stop, just stop, stop, mate. Like, this is not sustainable. You can't, this is back in 2016. And he was like, you just can't, you just cannot do it. And the very next day I handed him a notice. I just saw this light, this light that I just needed to see where it was just like, I can stop now. I, can, I, just, I have to stop now for my own health. And, and I did, and it took, I don't think you ever, you ever essentially recover from that. Like I said, the, the balance between you know, recovering off long days, et cetera, when you do it for a period of, well, nearly 10 years, you never, you never actually recover from that. Like mentally and physically, you don't actually, you know, the damage has been done, to be quite honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, especially in your early life. When I, when I, when I, you know, when I didn't fuel myself and, and, and worked ridiculous hours, you never really recover from that. But what you can do is make sure that you don't sort of, you know, do the same scenario for the next generation. But that was that was the, that was the, almost the pinnacle of it. I, I just got to that point, and I remember finding my well, she's met my wife now, Charlotte, at the time, and we didn't live together. She lived in down in Portsmouth, and she was like, "Tom, like, it's, it's scary. It's like really scary." I said, "No, it is. It's scaring me. So I need to come out of it." And, and that was it. So I suppose the question for me is like, we work in an industry which is driven by passion, pride, yeah. you know, and there seems to be this thing where you can't have a life and you yeah. can't work in hospitality at the same time. Like yeah. the, two, the two shouldn't go inside. You can't have health and you can't work in hospitality. Yeah, so so for you to have that, that experience, mm. which was like you know, quite scary, yeah, to be honest, it? and having to make that decision, mm. how did you feel like knowing that you had to do so, otherwise your health was gonna suffer? Well, I mean, my, I, suffer, I suffer from anxiety since I was 14, 13, 14. I'll be brutally honest, I, I, I fear death. That's my sort of anxiety, really. So mm -hmm. probably got into the completely wrong industry um, in that remark, obviously fearful of those sort of scenarios. But So I, I used to have episodes at school, really, and that's what sort of, and obviously that I didn't really know the root cause of it. I, I, I'd, I'd naturally overthink those sort of scenarios that, yeah. that got me into a bit worked up, etc. And unfortunately, I didn't need anything to sort of, I didn't need to overthink anything in work. It just happened naturally because I was overworked yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, just, and just tired, you know, just, just, ex, just complete exhaustion. So, um, yeah, for me, those, those episodes sort of were always, were always there. Uh, there was no two, two ways about it, but there, there, there is that balance. I think the, there's just that complete, there's that complete written rule or the was in cooking where it was like, you, it's, that, it's that army sort of strict feeling towards you where it's like the toughest survive it's then that's that, that's just what they think and that isn't the case at all yeah um it doesn't need to be like that but that, that's unfortunate how they were taught so they naturally teach the exact same way that's the way that hospitality is that's, right? like that, hospita that's what we hear exactly and it's where well, you, you, know, you only need to speak to friends and family that like, oh it's tough isn't it you know oh, what about the social aspects you know it's like well 
No, you're right. Growing up, it was like that. You know, you missed birthdays, you missed weddings, you missed Christmases, you missed all this thing. There's an expectation for you to do that, and that shouldn't be expected. You should have a choice still. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That, 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 that's what's important. That's what completely gets missed. And I said, for us, I said, we, we, we will never, ever open over Christmas. We shut Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, uh, Boxing Day, the day after Boxing Day. So we spend time, then we close for six weeks a year. We're a four day, we operate four days, but we do 48 hours in those four days. So yeah, yeah. We, it's imperative we still take 29 days holiday a year. Um, and, and the reason why we're structured, to be fair, with the holiday, which people can have mixed opinions on that, I get that totally. If we were, um, if we were able to do sort of have, have people off to take their own holidays at any given ch- time they wanted to, which we offer days all the time. But if it was if it was like that, the problem is we wouldn't have a full team for the whole year. Yeah. So I, I use it and I flip it on the other side and say, well, listen, we, we almost break three months, uh, three months at a time, so we don't overwork. It's three months. Yeah. The whole team can galvanise each other. And again, see if people are struggling. We like we can see you struggling. We see you a bit, you know, a bit tired. Come in a bit later tomorrow. We can yeah. we can actually communicate with each other, which again is a bit of a it's a wild thought that we can actually communicate with each other. And there's not a set procedure, and you have to get through it. Even if you're struggling, you have to get through it. Of course, that that isn't the case. We we support each other, and and we ensure that we have six weeks off, which which enables us to really which enables us to recover. But on top of that, we have three days off a week as well. So you put a lot of protective systems in place. I use the analogy of like in a high performance kitchen, right? Yeah. It's like it's like Usain Bolt running around the track and then stopping, having a shot of espresso, a slice <laughs> of pizza, a quick yeah. cigarette, and then doing again. And his legs are starting to hurt. He goes, ah, do you know what? It'll be fine, another espresso, and I'll be okay, right? Yeah, yeah. But in reality, we should be treating our teams like we do in a high-performance area where so you true. have a massage therapist come in to yeah, do yeah. sports massage. Yeah, you yeah. eat the right level of nutrients and balance minerals. That's imperative, that is. So it sounds like you are, you're, you've taken, from your own experience, and having to take that time out of hospitality... You've now put in a structures to help support your team. Absolutely. But what supportive mechanisms do you have in place? So if your team were to start struggling, yeah. you sound like you've got a good peer support. You know, you can have a chat internally. What systems have you put in place from your own experience that now your team can access? Well, obviously, I touch, I touch on the, the, the health side of things. So I used to, I used to be a regular at the doctors um, for like six, for a good six years of my life, from like 20 to 26, 27. I was, I was absolutely adamant there was something actually physically, you know, physically wrong with me. Like I was going to die, etc. Like I mentioned. So um, for us, I think it's, the, the, the first point of call for me is without a doubt is, is setting up that out, outsourced as well. So nothing to do with upstairs, nothing to do with me, nothing to do with the business. They're, they're private things that you want to discuss in your own time. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we set up obviously yeah, we, like we mentioned WPA, which is um, essentially a, a you know private healthcare, uh, both physical and mental, which is obviously so so important because they are two completely different things. And uh, it's, it's again, you can get a same day appointment, same day prescription if you want. That will go, that will go on another tangent with that thing. I think you can, I think you can manage an awful lot of mental health yourself. I think you can with the right tools yeah. uh, and the right people around you. Uh, but it's imperative that they they outsource that from themselves, and uh, and, that, and that, that, that's essentially what it is. But also, the simple fact is, is we, we just don't have we don't have those type of people in upstairs as well. So long gone are the times when you look at a CV and they've got a Michelin or two Michelin star restaurant on the CV, like, yeah, I'll take them. Especially being a business owner, it's imperative you get the right people in your business, the right people who, who support each other mm-hmm. and get on with each other. And there's no egos, there's no, there's no, no sort of aggression. It's just we want to we we strive for excellence, of course we do. We're still in an amazing trade because yeah. it is amazing. And we still want to really perform to our best of our ability. But from a business owner and a business perspective, from a platform, we need to ensure that we give them the tools, and that's if it's fuel or WPA or whatever, even yeah. if down to the uniform and fucking shoes and you know, everything. Yeah, we need yeah, to supply yeah. that, that, that. That's not that, that's normal. But in our trade, it's completely abnormal because it's like... I know, you buy your own knives, don't you? And you buy your own uniform. Uh, well, no yeah, one teaches upstairs. us that we can claim it back on tax. Or well, of like, course, or, that's what I mean. It's, it's, it's actually beneficial. Like, taking them out. Like we said we went to the AA Awards, uh, obviously... Paid for travel, naturally, it's not a compliment, but paid for travel, paid for the hotels. Then I booked them in for breakfast the next day at Fallow, table of 10. Yeah. I said, guys, order what the hell you want. And they're like, oh, my God, I can't believe you're doing this. I was like, well, no, I drive, I drive in, I go to the tax man. They're the tax person. That's exactly how it is. It's like, you know, reinvest in your team. It's, yeah. That's the best, best form of reinvestment. Yeah, it's massive. And like for us, like so for example, we have WPA as well. So big shout out to Dan. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Who's Dan also, Wade. yeah, he runs his own charity as well. Absolutely. Table, Table Talk. Talk, big charity. Yeah, I've done a couple um, of dinners for them and they're, yeah, they're an amazing charity. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's amazing the benefit of being able to actually then start to claim money back on those sort of things and have those support structures. But it's also like making sure that the team are valued and that they are looked after. Absolutely. And I think there's a really interesting opportunity here in hospitality to move so far ahead of 
any competition. You can overtake everything, yeah. Just by doing the things that I you're know. doing because you'll stand out really, really well. Like, that, it, sounds, it sounds like a great place to work. I think, I think listen, I mean, f food as well. Food is such, it's, it's social. It's, it's, it's such a social gaining sort of platform where, yeah, you, are, you, eat, you eat, you know, a lot of restaurants are in people's eyes, in people's minds. They're completely aware of it. It's very fashionable. Our industry is very fashionable, isn't it? So it, whatever we can do to essentially really promote those important factors, they will be multiplied because of, because of how many eyes and minds are on them. There's no two yeah. ways about it. And there's so many platforms where we can really pursue and push. But like we went back to that mentality, back, you, know, you could be doing this, obviously it wouldn't be this project, but 20 years ago, you might have a different assortment of chefs on here talking about and what, the, what the guests would like to hear would be very much how aggressive those kitchens are, yeah. how much you swear. And, and, and that, 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 was the, that was the hunger from the guests. The guests enjoyed that. Yeah, they yeah. were like, "Oh, is yeah. it really shouty in there? Oh, I can't wait to see someone get, you know, get shouted at and stuff." It's like, so they're coming to they're coming to the restaurant now, and we still get those people who are going, "Oh, it's pretty quiet. It's a bit quiet in there. It's not much swearing." No, well, why would we speak to each other? That like stereotype that? of that that old school sort of mentality, yeah. and it still happens. There well, are still course, environments still where it goes, like that. it's so like even when I started in this trade sort of 14 years ago, mm. I came into environments like that and I'd walk into a kitchen and you walk in at the wrong time, you go, get the fuck out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, and you started to see this change and you, you could feel the differences in, in the kitchens. Absolutely. But, you know, this is a profession of choice. It's a profession that people should be proud of and Definitely. a career. And we need to do more to promote. And as culinarians ourselves, mm -hmm. I think it's important that we talk about how great it is. Absolutely. And, create and, and an just focus on the good parts. Yeah, Absolutely. they're safe for our children, ultimately. Absolutely. And I think, you know, we talk a lot uh, during training sessions about, we ask hospitality professionals, you want people to work in hospitality? Yeah, it's great. Love it. Okay, cool. Uh, so you support people like Hospitality Rising? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hospitality. Woo! Would you let your children work in it? And they were like, fuck no. No, chance no we're not going to let our children work in this industry. And so we How need to support something like change. That? Yeah, yeah. We need to change that, that dynamic. So you've got supportive structures in place. You've got what well, it sounds like work-life balance and time off to rest and recuperate. 100%. But I'm interested to know where do you go from here? Yeah. How do you, what would you like to see in the next five, 10 years time in terms of either your own internal structures and mm. support mechanisms or the industry as a whole in terms of being able to make sure that this is a long-term viable career? I think, I think, well, the first thing answers both sectors, so mine personally and also my industry. I think we've just got to be, we've got to be super aware of, of, of what goes on. We can't ignore it at all. We need to listen to every, every single person. There's no two ways about it. So that's in my industry and equally in the restaurant. But also, it's, 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 almost having, it's also having the desire to want to improve that aspect of your business. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? So you, as, a, as, a, as a business owner, you, you, you prioritize that. That's what it has never been prioritized. It has never been focused. No one's had a desire to want to change that part of it. It's an expectation of a conveyor belt of people that are just going to, you, you don't last, you go, I'll, I'll just replace you with someone else. Yeah, yeah. That isn't, that isn't, that isn't uh, an, you know, an ingredient for a successful business in any sector. Um, so the first and, first and foremost is to ensure that becomes a priority. And if it becomes a priority, we'll be more aware of every single avenue that comes off of it. So things, shows like this, if it's over on social media or whatever it, whatever it is, it's imperative that that, 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 that change happens. Yeah. So we, we're seeing people from, I mean, I've, we've got two apprentices upstairs and I'm, I'm a massive advocate of apprentices. That's exactly how I came through. And uh, it's, for me, it's the best, best case of learning. Those are the people that you need to almost, I'm not going to say you need to almost look for or look out for more because you shouldn't, you, everyone's the same, but at the same point, you want to try and teach them what, exactly what the industry you want it to be as well. Yes, so maybe yeah, it's yeah. not quite there yet, if, you're, if, if upstairs is, but there's still, there's always improvements in every avenue, regardless if you're ticking a couple of boxes, it's not about that, it's about improving all the time. Yeah. And uh, so we've got Matilda and Harry who have both started from, from both from University College of Birmingham, which I've obviously got a great relationship with. And when Stuart comes, who's, who's the main guy there, when Stuart comes to the restaurant and we have a chat, it's, it's so refreshing because a lot of the guys in Birmingham have been there for a long, long time. Yeah. They just want an extra pair of hands. Yeah, yeah, send, it, yeah, send them. It's fine. I'll just an extra pair of hands. Don't get nurtured. Just go straight into the same kitchen as it was 20 years ago. Yeah. Upstairs, we, we work with them. Do you know what I mean? So they, they, they almost, they're almost just flies on the wall for the first two, three, four weeks. They never, they never come in at 40 hours. They always start on 32 hours. They yeah. all do. So we, we, we pay them a full contract, but they start on 32 hours. So that they, they miss dinner services, they miss lunch services, but it's imperative because I don't want them just coming in doing 48 hours as a 16, 17 year old, 
not seeing their parents as much as they did. So it's like one day they were coming home from college at three. Yeah. Next day they're coming home from upstairs at 11. Yeah, it's, yeah, like, yeah, it's, yeah. Not, it's not sustainable. So again, it's, it's nurturing them into that and that understanding. But Matilda started in Jan and it was only September when she went full, full time. And she was itching. She was like, I just want to be, I, just, I hate going home. She's like, I, I see you guys. And I'm like, do, do lunch service. And I'm like, I'll see you later. And we're like, see you later, Lee. And then she's like, can I stay? And it's like, yeah, well, yeah, no, yeah. no, no, you've got to, you know, go. it's amazing. That's where you sort of want it, do you know what I mean? And it's, but like, like, like I, I um, mentioned earlier, I think the, what, the one defining factor for me was I was going home. I was going home after working at you know, some of these kitchens where I did. And I was so, I was worried. I was, I was anxious. I was overwhelmed. I was unhappy. I was physically and mentally drained. And um, I, I just didn't enjoy it any part of it like any part of it but I was putting myself through because that was the understanding that I thought well I need to, I need to work in these kitchens because it's the only way I'm going to get the best out of it or the best mm -hmm. out of the industry that probably was the case unfortunately so the, the two two stars I worked in there's only 19 two Michelin star restaurants in the country at that time yeah, yeah, yeah. and I've worked in I worked in two of them so it's like and the other two stars were either heavily London based or, or whatever so it was it, every kitchen was essentially the same and expected the same from you and I wanted to learn so it was almost that, 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 that sort of scenario but what I would say is those kitchens never got the best out of me because I wasn't physically able to give my best well your presenteeism right you're, you're at work but you're not firing on 100% and exactly yeah so your performance was it was it was def definitely fifty like percent, fifty percent, a hundred percent of the time. Yeah. But best because you, you are you you're, ab you're physically absolutely shattered, like shattered. And when, when if your days off are just purely for recovery and not mm. enjoyment, that completely eradicates the idea of what a day off is. Yeah. You yeah. should enjoy your days off. You should want to have the energy to go out and see your family, to go out and go shopping, to go out and see the rest, whatever it might be. Yeah, yeah. Not just to recover, not just have those two days to recover. Sundays used to be just in bed all day. And Monday, I would try and run a few errands and just do bits and pieces and then go to bed early for Tuesday. That's just what I like, you know what I mean? I know. I remember, I remember doing a 15-hour shift in, in a nightclub and, uh, in Bournemouth, and I got home, and I rested my head at 3 o'clock in the morning on my, on my wheel, on my driving wheel. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my And that was God, it. Yeah. Three hours later, I woke up, and my legs and body were so stiff, I couldn't actually <laughs> get out of the car as well. I was like, oh, well, this is it. I'm, I'm stuck in the car for the next day. But I think that we have to acknowledge that there is... A tremendous load put upon physical mental health Absolutely. stress levels adrenaline and yeah. you know even from stress your body will ache and it will hurt from experiencing that and to understand that this isn't like other sectors there are similarities but it's actually how we go above and beyond now to combat yeah. the physiological the behavioral and the psychological effects of working in this great industry this fantastic industry you of know it's, it's and almost also so here's a question for you how do you combat, so you've got apprentices, young people coming in, you know, they can be easily influenced, you're bringing them into a great culture, right yeah. environment. How do you teach them how to manage their stress and not fall into the same traps that perhaps we've done, yeah. which is you're enjoying that stress and pushing and pushing and pushing at self-sacrifice? Well, you, you would never speak about it, would you? So you'd never speak about it 15, 16, 17 years ago when I first started. You just wouldn't, you wouldn't, it would be through complete embarrassment and um, complete fear of, of, of people just sort of taking the mick out of you or whatever. You would never say, oh, you know, I really struggled sleeping last night. I, I, I'm a bit, I feel a bit anxious for work. You just get, you just get, you know, just, you just get the mickey taken out of you, unfortunately. Mm. So I think the, the one of the proudest things, you mentioned that word a, a second ago, one of the proudest things I am proud of at Upstairs is the culture that we've created. And the culture has been created by the whole team. It's not, I appreciate things have filtered down from the top and I, I, I get that. And it's, it's, it's where, you're dire, where, you, where you've directed everybody or where you'd like the direction to go from a support perspective, more importantly. But, um, but no, the culture is something upstairs I'm so proud of because everyone, everyone does support each other. You don't have to like befriend someone and spend every second of every day in their pockets yeah. or, or every day off. It's like, I've got to go, go and see these for a coffee. You haven't got to do that. You know, I think one of the big things as well is separating that actually. So having your, having your personal life, which is actually very separate to professional one. And I, I, would, I would say, don't try and you know, befriend them, obviously, but don't try to spend seven days a week with the same people because even that can have an effect. Even though it's a nice time to spend with them, you can just have the break, do you know what I mean? Have a, from work, it's essentially have a break from work, yeah, of yeah. course it's. But, um, but culture is the main thing. So for, in that sort of environment, and I've done it with Tilly myself, um, it, it, it's been a proper manager. So it's recognizing when these people are down. It's recognizing different little things about their personality or what they say or how they say, if they're quiet or speak about it or can be uh, come protective over a certain scenario or conversation. 
And you just take, pull him to one side and just communicate in. We can communicate. It's okay. You know, it's that classic sort of sentence. It's okay to not be okay. I wouldn't say it's, it's not that you're not okay. It's, it's okay just to speak about something that may be worrying you or troubling you at home. You, I'm, I'm a manager. It's not. I don't just teach you how to cook. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. That, those, those days are long gone. I've got a team essentially that can support us on that and understand that. I think it's imperative as a manager and employee that you, you want to have your, 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 your whole entire team of staff firing on as, as many of those good cylinders as you possibly can. And it's your job solely to ensure that they're, they're okay. And if they're not okay, you be fucking talk about it. Do you know what I mean? And I think yeah. creating that platform where if it's not me, if they don't come direct for me, it's important that you have other people in places uh, of, of, all, of, all, of all genders as well, because people might only feel comfortable talking to like, to like females or males or whatever. It's imperative that that's, that, that that's available to them as well. Uh, and quiet rooms, quiet spaces. Um, and I said WPA is a huge one because the, the mental health side, which I've used since I opened as well, um, it's just a, a nice platform where you can just ask questions. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And they'll give you the right answers, in my opinion. And you've got that external conduit because there's obviously this big fear that if we use uh, mental health resources or Absolutely. if we admit any sign of weakness and effectively we could end up losing our career but having external resources like that or like the Burnt Chef project allows people to be able to get Absolutely. the help that they need Absolutely. make sure that their hygiene is also good as well Absolutely. like we talk about like brushing our teeth right we yeah. brush our teeth every day to stop yeah. our teeth from falling out yeah we don't wait for them to fall out and then go ah and then do you know what it's so true yeah, that is. yeah right? no, you and don't so yeah it's like so true providing the tools and resources to do that so as a final question then for you to, to, to wrap this up, because we only got half an hour, unfortunately. You but, could um, speak about it forever, couldn't you, really? We could, yeah, I, I think we could probably push it. Yeah. So if we're looking at encouraging people into this industry, a young 16, 15-year-old, yep. maybe perhaps even 10 or 11, and they've, yeah, 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 yeah. they've, they've enjoyed watching it on TV, yeah, yeah. What, what would you say to a young person now to encourage them into this industry? What would you say... Well, um, there's still a long way to go for us to encourage that, 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 that sort of age bracket, in my opinion. Um, we get, we get, we, we've had 10, 11, 12-year-olds come to upstairs, uh, you know, super passionate. If they've, seen, if they've obviously seen, seen us on GBM or whatever it might be, and it's, it's an amazing thing to, 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 to sort of see. Um, and it's, it's amazing for such, such young people to be interested in food. I mean, I, never, I didn't eat in my first Michelin star restaurant until I actually started in restaurants, until I was 18. So I didn't have that natural sort of desire to become a chef at all. Uh, but then equally, I don't know how much that sort of age bracket really understand the industry. But what I can guarantee is there's restaurants out there and there'll only, there'll only be more of them by the time they're into work, where, where, where we do prioritize staff and we do prioritize those, those, those vital those vital um, avenues to, to help support everybody. And that's it really. I think for us to encourage those people in, I think it's making a beeline to promote them when, when they first come. Yeah. So it's actually talk about them. Like I said, communication is a big, a big factor. To ma make sure they, they're aware of where your, where your fundamental qualities and fundamental reasons be uh, towards business lay. If you're just, just, just about the food and you don't care about anything else, then it's not a sustainable business. On top of that, if you're, if you're happy just to replace people all the time, that's not sustainable regardless of business. And if you get these incredible characters in, you'll, you want to keep them in your business because yeah. they improve every aspect of it. So why wouldn't you? So you try every single avenue to ensure that you do keep them. But equally, you don't want to you know, lock them in, not want them to, to open their wings and, 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 and grow. Of course you do, but equally, you have a care, you have a care about them. And I think that's, that's one of those, those key words that was, 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 is, has been completely missing from this industry. I don't think any head chef I've ever worked for actually goes home and cares about me. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. That's a weird thing. But like for me, if someone's had a rough day, I will think about them and I will make sure that they're okay and I will talk to them. I will talk about it and, and try and get over that and try and resolve that as an issue. I don't think they could. Keep, I don't think my former employees, as amazing as they are, yeah. I don't think they ever went home and actually. I mean, I'm, listen, I'm, I'm probably. I'm probably out talking them in that direction, but at the same point, I don't think they did. I don't think they really cared. If it didn't work out, I think they would have replaced me with relative ease. It was a different time back then, though, as well. Like, you know, it's that old saying: is if you leave, then there'll be another three people who but come that, to that replace you. That isn't the case now at all. No, you know, we've all. we've done we've done the damage to our industry ourselves, yeah. and it's now about highlighting organisations yeah. like yourself who have actually gone look proper proper profitability. Yeah, is rested upon yeah. having people who want to be there Absolutely. who feel loved who feel cared for and who are ready to perform Absolutely. and who aren't going to suddenly leave within well less than 90 days which yeah, is yeah. the average tenure so that's and unbelievable that is I mean, yeah like 125% turnover rates in hospitality on average mm. 
and sometimes we've heard the 400%. Mm. Um, and there are organizations out there, you know, that have got 33%, which is good. It's yeah, great, it's good. you know. Uh, but I think we've got a long way to, to go in terms oh, yeah, of normalizing definitely. that mm. as like the, the average mm. rather than the exception. And so on a personal note, on a final thing then, and so what things have you learned in terms of managing your own mental health and keeping yeah. it on? Yeah, as you say, when you recover, you always know that it's in the back of your mind. Yeah, but of course. What have you learned about yourself in terms of being able to manage your own health and drive your performance moving forward? One of the main issues that I had, was, which I obviously mentioned earlier, was, was I would push myself too far. So I'd, I'd push myself to that extent of exhaustion. So I'd just be mentally and physically exhausted. And that would then spiral into me having sort of episodes, really. So, and I, but I know now. So I had, I had cognitive health therapy at the time when I, was, when I just left Sat Baines. And um, there's a lady called Sophie, and I must have had about oh, 12, 14 sessions with her. I just enjoyed talking to her, to be quite honest, because it was someone who was completely aware of what I was saying. So it's not just your parents where you say, I've had these episodes, they're like, oh, you'll be all right, son, don't worry about it, just relax, yeah. have a day off, etc. It's not, <laughs> I need tools to help repair me, not a good sleep isn't going to do fuck all, do you know what I mean? That, that, yeah, yeah. that was where it was at. So for me, it was a case of actually speaking to someone who totally understood what I was going through, totally understood and appreciated that I needed sort of support. But um, from a pharmaceutical perspective, it didn't help me at all. It was, it was very physical I needed. I needed physical tools that could help me. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I'm, I'm a big advocate for that. I think you know, your, your, your brain is an incredible muscle that you can, you can sort of, you know, you can get on top of and you can, you can obviously manage. Yeah. And uh, for me, that was the case. And uh, we, we used to speak out scenarios, scenarios in the kitchen and my fears. And uh, she used to speak out scenarios of the opposite end. So she was like, okay, instead of thinking only from a fear point of view, can, you, can we start looking at something positive? So I reenacted those through my head. And then so I'd actually do the act and it'd be a lot closer to a positive outcome than it would a fear, you know, a negative yeah, one. Yeah, so yeah. over time you, you, become, you become that and it, you, know, you, you repeat those processes. But I still, have, I still have episodes now because running any business is extremely stressful. Not every day is all, all sort of happy, happy Larry and, and Roses. Of course it isn't. You, a customer can can put a spanner in the works. Yeah. Uh, anything can. Physical in the, in the restaurant, you can have issues within the restaurant. Can put can put really stresses onto it. And when you're operating at a level of a Michelin star, you do naturally you do naturally fear losing it. You don't feel you don't you don't you don't just look at gaining another one. You yeah. fear losing your reputation because there's a, there's a huge expectation of customers there. I think there's, there is an expectation of customers where they they're happy to listen and they're happy to to, to really value and go. Oh, well done, Tom. It's amazing. Your four day weeks and. But the, 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 issue that, the issue that I've got is that one of the main problems is we have to cook in social times. So lunch has to be at lunchtime and dinner has to be yeah. at dinner time. So there's not really, that, that isn't really sustainable in essence of hours. So it's imperative that where you do open a business that they're always going to be longer days they are, unless we split the team in half, which obviously is 100% is a possibility. But it's down to the customers to help support that financially. So I think it's finding that balance between, okay, we do do long days. Our guys do 12 to 13 hours a day, which is long, mm -hmm. but we do them, well, we do three of those a week and we do half a day on a Wednesday. So we're between 45 and 48 hours a week, which I mean is, is, is great. They get paid 48 hours with service charge and tips on top, yeah, yeah, yeah. which again is, 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 is quite a, is quite a for me, it's quite an interesting, uh, well, it's interesting is the, the main word, but an interesting sort of category we could talk about again, but we pay, we, we pay them what, what they work. It's as simple as that. So would you like to see in future Michelin not just rating the service we, I've said and this, the quality I've said of this, food, I've said this in March. actually rating I, I, I retention just, I and I think they, sh they, shouldn't, they shouldn't categorize it because they're giving the sustainability awards to the Green Star. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what we spoke about earlier, sustainability is great, Sustainability covers, covers a huge array. Yeah. They just focus on recycling. That, 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 that's all they really focus on, which is, which is, which is, which is great. But sustainability, sustainable comes in a lot of different factors. Yep. But we focus just on, they, they seem to focus on the green star, gives it all about, about economical and carbon footprint, and, which is amazing, which is, which is awesome. But I would like them, from a Michelin star, I would like them to actually look if that business is actually a, a viable running business. Yeah. I think that's it. I think that's, I think that's really, really important. And also with the, inspector, in the inspections, making notes of if they, if they recognize the same people again. Are they served yeah. by the same people year in, year out? Are they served by different people year in, year out? Are they, is their focus purely on, it doesn't matter that the team's different every single time I go there. The food's really good. The food's still good. That's great. But... Let's just dig a little bit deeper. Is it a sustainable business? Is it a, yeah. sta is it a sustainable um, you know, ethos, culture within those type of things? I would love to see it. I don't think it will happen.
I would love to see it. it doesn't need, we, don't need, we don't need it to be a award. We, we shouldn't be rewarded for looking after our staff. That's yeah. fucking normal. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That should be completely normal. At the same point, I'd like to see organisations like that have such a huge, a huge part of our trade and business. I would love them to sort of yeah, make a bit of a beeline to sort of look into, into businesses like that. I think you're right. It is going to take some time. I mean, Michelin were quoted fairly recently about calling the whole mental health thing a trend. Uh, wow. which came from the head office. That's so I think we're still a little way away until we get yeah. some forward-thinking individuals within it. Yeah. But you know, we've developed an accreditation scheme that is benchmarked in science as well. Mm -hmm. So we're able to actually measure all your processes, your structures, your supportive elements, and then we benchmark it against psychometric testing. So we can actually tell how your team are feeling, what their burnout and presenteeism rates is. So you know, there are tools now that hopefully at some stage I mean, this is on a global scale we've developed yeah, yeah, yeah. this, so we can go to the likes of Michelin and say, look, consider including this as part of the Green Award, Absolutely. maybe, or maybe even just having it as part of your standard award. W you that's what I would like to see. Yeah, you don't need to redesign the wheel. So yeah. um, I think we're dangerously at risk of overrunning. Yeah, so, okay. Tom, I'd like to thank you ever so much for, for spending the time with us. and. Yeah, absolute pleasure talking to you. No, thank you for inviting me. It's a subject that's obviously yeah, I'm quite quite sort of close to my heart, really. And uh, going through those sort of scenarios for myself, I just wouldn't wish that on anyone in the industry, let alone someone who works for me. So yeah, it's imperative we talk about it and talk about it more often. Nice to done, man. Thank you very much. Well done.